Good evening, and welcome to the evening services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, July the 3rd. Uh, per usual, we will sing a few songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and then I will have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial, enlightening, and uh, edifying to all of us. We're singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, and if you do not have that book, I will give you the name of the song so that you can go to your device or your own songbook and find it. The first song that we will sing is entitled, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It is number 202 in Songs of Faith and Praise. 202, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. <clears throat> Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depths of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our Brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. And if you would turn to number 246, the title of this song is Let Me Be a Sacrifice. 246. Let Me Be a Sacrifice. <clears throat> Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice worshiping your name. Before the Lord's Supper, let's sing number three. 66, 366 by Christ Redeemed. <clears throat> by Christ Redeemed in Christ Restored 
we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come his body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread and as we drink we see the blood until he And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of loving bright Until he comes we pause in the service, and it's not really a pause. It's a part of the service. It's part of the service that we have been commanded to observe on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week, we are to uh, break bread together. We were uh, instructed to come together for that very, very reason. Uh, I believe that this breaking of bread refers to the communion service, uh, sometimes called the Eucharist sometimes called the Lord's Supper. In this part of the service, we remember what Jesus did for us as part of your divine plan. We remember that he went to the cross. He gave up his innocent body. He shed his innocent blood that uh, we might have eternal life, that uh, we might uh, draw closer to you. And so it's at this particular time in the service that we focus all our attention to Jesus's death. Uh, if you would, let's pray for the bread. We just thank you so much, dear God, that uh, your son was willing to come down from your right hand, that he was willing to come down in human form, knowing what his fate would be, knowing that he would suffer the physical agony of death, though innocent. And uh, we know the pain that racked his body, and we know that he did this just for uh, all of us that are listening here, all of us that are his children, that uh, he gave up his body for us. Be with us as we partake this bread. Uh, bless us, help us to remember what it uh, is a symbol of. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We thank you, dear God, that again, Jesus was not only willing to have his body racked with pain, but that his innocent blood was shed. The life-giving force within him uh, just uh, flowed out of his body. And we understand that the greatness and the power that is in uh, that blood, it is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of sanctification. It is the blood that allows our sins to be forgiven. Bless us as we partake we pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And also on the first day of the week, we are instructed to uh, take what we have laid by in store and give it back to the Lord. In today's society, in today's religious society, that means giving it back to the church. We give it back to the church because the church is the one vehicle, the kingdom of God here on earth, that uh, uh, is designed to do your will. 
we just pray that uh, the monies that we give will be uh, will be used uh, in such a way that that your will will be pronounced all about the world that those who are in need can be aided help us to uh, always think globally but act locally and that our monies would be uh, used in that way let's pray we just uh, thank you heavenly father that uh, we have this time set aside in the service that uh, we can give back to you what is but your own help us to understand that we came into this world with nothing we will leave this world with nothing and that all that we have belongs to you uh, help the church to utilize the monies that are given uh, for the betterment of this world. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And our last song before the lesson will be 709. 709. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight. 709. How sweet. How heavenly. <clears throat> how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one and other's feast delight and so fulfill the word. When each can feel his brother's sigh And with him bear a part When sorrow flows from eye to eye And joy from heart to heart when free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes all above, each can his brother's failing side and show a brother's love. When love in one delightful stream through every bosom flows, when union sweet and dear esteem in every action glows, Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. Thank you for participating in the song service. I know that I was lifted up by it. I hope you were. And I hope the Lord was adequ adequately praised uh, through our voices and uh, our feelings of, of um, adoration for our God and our Creator. This evening, I would like to talk about something that I think is, is rather important to all of us, and that is authority. Without authority in our lives, uh, whatever part of our lives we're talking about, uh, there would be a sort of anarchy. In the book of Judges, uh, we know a couple of different times in Judges 17.6 and in Judges 21.25, these words were spoken. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what's right, did what was right in his own eyes. There was no authority. Uh, that makes the strongest person right, unfortunately. Now, the dictionary defines authority as power to influence or command. That is command thought, opinion, or behavior. And so the main purpose of authority is to promote order. 
whether it's in the nation, whether it's in our home, the church, or specifically individually in our own lives. With that, all authority is based upon some kind of law. We know that God gave the law to Moses, and uh, this was the law that the children of Israel lived by up until the time of Jesus Christ. In a confrontation with the chief priests and the scribes, Jesus basically said there are only two sources of authority. We feel that authority either comes from God or it comes from man. Man-made authority comes in several forms. I'd like us to real quickly look at, at man-made authority. There's something out there called humanism. A humanist uh, believes, I believe, uh, it, that humanism is an outlook or system of thought that attaches prime importance to human rather than supernatural uh, matters. In other words, the humanist uh, does not allow God to uh, come into the equation of his life. And with that in mind, uh, we know that they feel like that God uh, doesn't have any care for people uh, to hear or to understand. And so the humanist would certainly not pray. The humanist would certainly not um, do anything that that uh, wouldn't relate to what a human would do and how a human would think. And so there's humanism. Also out there, there is this feeling that uh, the best way uh, for us to live is to follow the majority. It's how our elections work, isn't it? Uh, the reality of it is, in a free society, it's the only way that uh, elections uh, can work. Isn't it interesting that usually in presidential elections, it usually comes down to one or two or so percentage points between the winner and the loser. And so the reality of it is, is whatever you want to consider a majority um, is defined uh, in such a way that that perhaps there are 49 to uh 49.5 people a uh, percent of the people that are you know are not pleased with the outcome so authority means that when more people believe something than don't believe it that that must make it right hmm so how does that work in the world is that viable well, let's take a look at some majorities. At the time of the flood, the majority of the people on earth died. Hmm. Doesn't look like they did very well, does it? Um, remember and think about this as a philosophy and remember that um, the majority of the people uh, that left Egypt to go to the promised land the majority of the people died before they crossed over the Jordan. Hmm. Majority didn't do real well, did they? Majority is not going to cut it. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14 says that there's a narrow gate and there's a broad gate. And there's more people that go through the broad gate than go through the narrow gate. There are more people that are going to be lost than are going to be saved. So in this case, majority just doesn't always work. And then there's that fallback. Well, you know what? I let my feelings be my guide. I, I will determine whether something is right or wrong, I'll determine whether I am going to follow a different path or whatever path I'm going to follow based on my feelings about it. And 
that leaves logic behind and allows emotions to rule. When feelings become the way that uh, we uh, decide how something is going to work out, we can remember Jesus' words. Uh, uh, better yet, let's listen to the words of the Proverbs. It says, There is a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. This also leads to anarchy because one's per one person's feelings, just based on their feelings, may be in conflict with another person's feelings. And so who among men is able to say, well, your feelings are more powerful than my feelings, so I should go along with you. <laughs> Therefore, everyone does what is right in his own mind. If some of those sounded almost silly, if some of those sound like they don't work, if there's a reason for it. They are silly and they don't work. Authority. God should be our only authority. We can go back to the very, very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. In any area, the Creator always has the authority to do with His creation anything that He wishes. And understand that we are created in the spiritual image of God. The Creator, because He is a loving and a holy Creator, has the right and the ability to teach us about love and holiness. To the Jews, God gave the law so that they could live and understand the differences between right and wrong. The understanding of honoring one's father and mother, putting no other God before them, not murdering, not stealing, not committing adultery. All of these things were based upon God's authority. And so what's great about God and why should God be the authority? Because God is omnipotent. God knows all that we need. You know, Jesus explained it this way. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. He, uh, verse 32, I'm sorry. He also knows what we need spiritually and has provided the means for us to become holy spiritual beings so that we can have fellowship with God. Because God is spirit, and those that wish to worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? Because God knows our every need. Therefore, he has the right to have authority. There's something else. How how close are you to some people? If you're married and you've been married for a long period of time, are you close to your spouse? Do you think alike in many ways? You do, don't you? And And that's one of the reasons we have very, very good friends because some of our best of friends and us think uh, basically on the same plane. But here's the kicker in that. As well as you may know your spouse, as well as you may know the best of your best friends, 
No one knows everything about you. No one knows what goes on in the deepest recesses inside of you. I said no one. No one human does. God knows everything about us. God knows everything about us. There's nothing that can be hidden from God. We know that Adam and Eve found this out the hard way. And, and after they had eaten of the tree that they were not supposed to eat of, all of a sudden they realized that they were naked and they fancy fixed things to, to cover what they consider their nakedness. And then realizing that they had done something wrong, they tried to hide from God. But God knows everything about us. He knew what Adam and Eve did. He knew what the sinful people before the flood did. He knew how the children of Israel disobeyed him in those 40 years of the wilderness. And he even knows, sadly enough, that there are more people that will go to destruction than will go uh, on to eternal life. The psalmist in Psalm 139 verse 1 to 6, express it this way. And in order for me to get this across, let me read these scriptures to you. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it, no matter how smart we are, no matter how brilliant we are, no matter how much wisdom we have, and we can pray for wisdom. We will never know everything about everything. And we will never know anything or everything about the people around us. That's reserved for God. He's the omnipotent one. He's the omnipresent one. God has all authority because he knows everything about us. And finally, God has the authority and has the right to have this authority because he loves us and he wants us to be with him in eternity. We just have some short lives here on earth. You know, they're measured in years. Some of us may get many, many years. Some of us, not so many years, but they are measured. And there will come a time when all of our, uh, all of us, uh, will have our life forces stopped. And it is then that what we have done in our bodies while we were alive will determine whether we spend eternity with the Lord. How do I know that God wants me to spend eternity with him? Let's look at his words in John 3, 16 and John 14, 1 to 3. We know John 3, 16, don't we? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. And then in John 14, verses 1 through 3, and this was to reassure his disciples because he had told his disciples that he was going away. They couldn't understand that because they'd become such an intimate part of uh, life with Jesus for those some three years that uh, he didn't want them to be troubled. And so he said to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so as we look at this, this aspect of authority in our life, what turns anarchy into things that make sense. Uh, when we look at authority, when we look at uh, the power or the influence or the command or the thought or the opinion or the behavior, where does it come from? Does it come from simply humans? Does it come from the majority? Does it, is it based upon just how we feel about things? Far be it. Our authority comes from God. It comes from God because he created us in his own image. It comes from God because he knows everything that we need. That authority comes from God because he knows everything about us. And finally, ultimately, and the most important aspect of all of this, it comes from God because he wants us to live in eternity with him. And so I hope that uh, the message this evening has given you a, a little more insight into what authority is all about and why it is important and why God is the one that should have the authority in our lives. God can only have authority in our lives if, if we have struck up the proper relationship with him. It's one of the reasons he sent Jesus to us. It's one of the reasons that Jesus died. It's one of the reasons he was buried and he resurrected from the dead. We, we understand that because it is through Jesus that we can get a, a closer relationship and come into a more godly relationship with God the Father. And we do that through Jesus' teachings. And it is taught in the New Testament how we can get started on this right relationship. It is uh, that we confess Jesus as the Son of God. It is that we repent of our former lives and that we are baptized for the remission of our sins. And then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the invitation to each of you this evening. If you have not accepted Jesus into your life this way, this is the invitation. If you've not uh, taken Jesus into your life through confession, repentance, and baptism, we want to aid you in that. I know we are in a virtual situation. Uh, we can't touch each other right now, but all you have to do is get in touch with one of us at any time, and we are ready. Uh, to aid you in coming into the kingdom of God here on earth. Let's end this service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for uh, your 
magnificence. And we're so grateful that we can put our lives in your hands and that we can be happy and satisfied that you are the main source of authority in our lives. Help us to go to you in prayer. Help us to, uh, to develop this relationship and that uh, you will know how much we care about you and that you will know how much we love you and how much we're, we're so grateful that you sent your son to us. And so bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we put our heads on the pillow this evening. Help us to uh, just uh, rest comfortably knowing that you are an integral part of our lives. Continue to be with us. Comfort us when we need comfort us, or when we need comforting. Aid us when we need to be aided. And help us, just as Jesus said that he came into this world to serve and not to be served. Help us to be wonderful servants of yours here on this earth. Continue to be with us and bless us. I pray this in his most holy name. Amen. I pray that all of you will be safe and may God bless you all. Wonderful, merciful,